No, good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, being the troopers that stayed for the very end of the, the program. And thank you so much to Ross and Amy for the opportunity to, to talk about this. This is something that I'm really passionate about, that I love, and clearly, you all must be, too. That's why you're here on a Saturday afternoon when you could be out riding a ferry boat. So thank you. So um, the topic I'm talking about is why should we care? And I think Amy and Don and Justin have given very compelling reasons from their different perspectives. Um, I, I'm going to give it from my perspective and, and my journey in, in this process. Um, no financial disclosures to make. So why should you care about advocacy, health policy, and reimbursement? I think it's mainly because what happens here in Congress, in, in our nation's capital, in our state capital, in our local regional leadership, absolutely, absolutely impacts what we do here. And as surgeons, we, we get very um, committed to doing the very best possible care in the operating room, but we forget that so much of what impacts what we do in the operating room is absolutely because of what happens on the local, the regional, and the national level. So that's why sh surgeons should care and should be here. And I'll explain why, what I mean when I say that we should be here. So I believe absolutely that surgeons have the power to impact health policy for our patients, for our colleagues, and for our future. But you don't have to be here. You don't have to be in Washington, D.C. You don't have to be in Congress to be here, to be at the table, and to make an impact on these policies and regulations. My talk is not going to be about the latest legislative uh, efforts. It's not going to be about the, the intricacies of payment reform or the hot, sexy, new healthcare topic, because frankly, these priorities change with administrations. We have ha excellent white papers and briefings from SAGES, from the American College of Surgeons Health Policy Bureau. We, we, we have them there in Washington, DC. But regardless of who's sitting in the seat in, in those administrations, we need to be at the table. It, this talk is going to be, how can you be at that table? And how to be here in the conversation, whether or not you are here in your state capital or your national capital. And we have the opportunity as surgeons and the obligation to be at that table. So I'm, I'm going to talk about one surgeon's journey, my journey, and, and share about my experiences that led to the role that I have. And hopefully, it can be something that you all can use as you're exploring opportunities to either advocate or be a part of health policy or, or maybe join the rock one day. So um, my, my story starts in Shreveport, Louisiana. And, and then I, I moved to Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, the state capital, to, to work in Medicaid. And then I returned back to the Veterans Affairs and uh, did the work there. Um, but what that really shows is that this is not a linear path at all. Wherever you are, you can be at the table and you can have a voice, whether you're at the state capital or you're in Washington, D.C., or whether in your small facility in Shreveport, Louisiana, you can be at the table and have a voice and be here at the table. And I think most importantly, I think as people who are passionate about making changes, about doing the best for our patients, we see the changes that are necessary. We see it so much better than the people who do not have that clinical experience, who aren't on the front lines. And the important thing is that not only do we see that change, but we can be the change that we want to see. So I'm going to start with my, my journey in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. These wonderful, beautiful folks here are my team when I was in uh, the Shreveport VA Medical Center. These are the nurses, these are the technicians, the anesthesiologists who make it possible for us as surgeons to do the work that we do. Um, I think one of the lessons I learned when I was in Louisiana is that start with what you know. And I started as a staff general surgeon at Shreveport VA, working full-time clinical, doing full-time surgery and, and uh, call and clinic and balancing and juggling all of that. But when I started there, it was a very small faci facility. We had few resources and we were an outlier for high mortality. Our mortality, our surgical 30-day mortality, was an odds to observe, uh, odds to expected ratio of um, 2.6. So we had 2.6 higher the mortality than what you would expect with uh, the comorbidities, 
we, we had a series of adverse events, routine sponges, wrong side surgery, death from hemorrhage within 24 hours, and we had issues with access. So what do you do when you're in that kind of situation? Start with what you know, and what I knew was quality, and what I knew is that we can make a change. There's a lot of evidence and literature from people in the health policy world, like uh, Dr. Dimmick, who've shown what is important for improving quality. So um, I founded and became the director for our Center for Innovations in Quality Outcomes and Patient Safety at the Shreveport VA, and we started tackling these difficult areas, and it was a team effort. This involved the nurses, the techs, the anesthesiologists, it involved the janitors, it involved the people in the PACU, it involved the people in recovery, it involved the people in the ICU, it involved everyone. It's not a one-person effort. Um, later, I became the assistant chief for general surgery section, which allowed me to do some more work in terms of um, leading these initiatives. And what did I find? Um, uh, what, what we did was over the course of two years, we made a lot of changes in terms of the culture in our operating rooms, implementing evidence-based interventions such as checklist, crew resource management, and we were able to reduce our surgical mortality from being an outlier for high mortality to being an outlier for low mortality. Our observed to expected ratio for mortality went from 2.6 to 0 0.6. We went from having retained sponges, wrong side surgeries, death from hemorrhage, to having zero occurrences of these. We went from having clinic no-shows, which impact access at rates of 25%, down to 10.5%. So what, what, what this goes to highlight is that you can be the change that you want to see, and start with what you know. And as surgeons, we are really well trained to do this. We are trained to lead teams. We are trained to turn chaos into order, and we are trained to get rapid results. Any of y'all in your, in your residency who has been in a trauma laparotomy, you know that you have to be able to lead teams. You have to be able to take that chaos and turn it into order, and you have to get rapid results or the patient is dead. And that is why I believe the surgeon is absolutely equipped to be a leader in health policy and advocacy. Um, and so the, the lesson I learned from that is start with what you know. We've, we're trained to do this. So um, after my time at the Shreveport VA Medical Center, I um, was recruited to Baton Rouge, the capital of uh, Louisiana. And um, uh, one of the lessons I learned there is that internship never ends. Uh, my experience during my time as uh, chief medical officer at Medicaid was uh, similar to internship, where you you're, you're feel like you're drinking of a, out of a fire hydrant um, and have everything thrown at you and uh, um, absolutely have so many people relying on you, and that's that's just like internship. Uh, you you have to be able to learn fast, learn quickly. So um, in my role as a chief milk officer for Medicaid, I oversaw the quality team, the benefits team, the covered services, clinical policy, pharmacy, and health IT. Um, in addition to that, there were the emerging crises that our state faced that required learning on the job. For instance, as uh, Amy mentioned, we had the Zika epidemic, which was going through the southern states. We became the first state to have a transmission prevention strategy for pregnant Medicaid women. We had the Louisiana Great Flood, which hit about two weeks after I started in Baton Rouge. And this uh, flood caused $20.7 billion in damage, and it hit the capital region, which is the nerve center for public response to these uh, disasters. Um, so we worked on uh, flood shelter, disaster responses, uh, helping people cope with uh, mold and, and uh, uh, the other effects of uh, flood, while at the same time trying to maintain a Medicaid office when 30% of our staff had lost their homes or their cars or in some way been affected. And in addition to maintaining the regular status quo of Medicaid, you have the fact that people have lost their wheelchairs in the flood, they've lost their medications, they've lost the transportation to be able to get to, um, to, to, to get medical care, and you have to be able to, to figure out a way how to make it happen for patients to get that. In addition, one of the uh, big issues that hit Louisiana was the opioid epidemic. In Louisiana, we actually had more opioid prescriptions than people in the state, and that's including babies and children. Um, 
so one of the, when, when I started tackling the opioid crisis in Louisiana, I think the biggest opposition I had was from the Louisiana State Medical Association, from doctors who didn't want to be told what to do or how to prescribe who saw it as an infringement on their medical practice. So this, again, is just like internship all over again, learning how to, to, to work in a hostile environment and to, to be able to make actual real progress. What we did was a lot of stakeholder engagement, um, which allowed us to, to go a year later from having this hostile relationship with a major medical society to having that medical society on the Senate floor a year later testifying in support of the legislation limiting opioid prescribing. So we were able to, um, I think, advance a lot in terms of the opioid epidemic because of the work to build stakeholder engagement, which is no different from when you're working with uh, medicine consoles and, and the nurse in the ICU and everyone to get your one patient taken care of and to get the needs taken care of. Um, at the same time, when I started, we also had Medicaid expansion and uh, enrolled in 500,000 new patients. And our job was to demonstrate to the legislature, the state legislature, that improving access actually impacts health care. And that's where I could rely on my knowledge as a surgeon to say that because these people got health insurance, they were able to get a colonoscopy and we were able to identify more than 5,000 people who had polyps. And I could tell a state senator that that's 5,000 people that are not going to show up in my operating room with a colon cancer down the road. So um, I, I think the key thing is that as a surgeon, we have a wealth of knowledge. We have a wealth of experiences that other people who don't have that experience really respect and rely on. We, we also looked at quality metrics. And when you talk about reimbursement, quality metrics are a huge, huge part of that. They determine whether or not you're going to get paid. They can determine whether or not services will be covered. So I think the lesson learned from my experience there is don't limit yourself to a niche. These, these are things that I never learned about in medical school and surgery residency. But these are things that we as surgeons in our training, whether it's in the trauma bay or, or, or whether it's that as an intern on day one uh, having to uh, uh, pronounce someone as dead, we're equipped to adapt and to learn fast. And that's what ex is extraordinary about being a surgeon, I think. So um, after my, my, my time in Baton Rouge, I got recruited back to uh, the Veterans Affairs Department, and I um, joined uh, the Houston VA to serve as Associate Chief of Staff. And I think the lesson I learned here is that it is so critically important to have a voice at the table. This picture is actually, um, I, I think I think I have a thing for disasters. About three weeks after I joined, uh, moved to Houston, we had Hurricane Harvey hit. And um, so this is the George R. Brown Convention Center. And in, in my role as the Associate Chief of Staff, I, I got sent out to, uh, I was told, Stryram, go and make sure we get our veterans taken care of at the flood shelters. Make sure we have a mobile medical unit down in, in Pearland in, in the suburbs of uh, Houston for the veterans who have no way to get to the hospital. But, but uh, I'll, I'll come back to the main point of this, which was about having a voice at the table. So I was doing things that had nothing to do with surgery, making sure that our 5,000 staff get flu shots um, because we had a lot of resistance from unions and all that, making sure that we uh, tackle uh, hospital-acquired infections through hand washing, looking at readmissions, looking at length of stay, and many of those actually were the medical or the primary care patients uh, population. But having a voice at the table, regardless of what the topic is, and bringing in your expertise is so valuable. Because of the work that I did at Hurricane Harvey and some of the other things at, at Medicaid, then I was uh, assigned uh, to serve as an advisor to the Secretary of the VA and to the Principal Deputy Undersecretary. And there, you have the opportunity to do so many things that really have a real impact on 9 million veterans' lives, whether it's making sure that our surgical sterilization process is safe and accurate, um, whether it's making sure that our, our uh, 3, 000, 365,000 employees in VAs across the country are engaged in a way that really serves our veterans. So 
one of the things I learned from that is that even though I moved from the capital to, to from Louisiana's uh, Baton Rouge to Houston, you don't have to be in the capital. You don't have to be there to be at the table. So that's why I keep saying you don't have to be here to be here. In any opportunity, in any position, you can be a part of that conversation. Um, and so when you are at the table, there will be opportunities. Embrace those opportunities. Um, this group of beautiful folks are all surgeons, except for the gentleman in the middle, the Stuart Altman. These are surgeons who participated in the American College of Surgeons Health Policy uh, uh, fellowship at Brandeis University. And this is one of the training opportunities that I availed myself of. And I bring this up because there are so many opportunities for surgeons, trainees, residents, medical students to participate in so that you can have the knowledge and the know-how to speak up at the table, to find the, the, the way to be at the table. So um, in terms of training opportunities, I was a Kaiser Family Foundation Health Policy Scholar in college, and I worked in the US Senate on Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Act and prescriptions and surgical equipment safety. Basically anything that got thrown at me, I was happy to do. But what I saw when I was there is that the people who are writing the legislation, who are writing the policies that affect us as doctors, these are like 24-year-olds straight out of college who are the healthcare policy director for Senator so-and-so. We need doctors and we need surgeons at the table there. Um, during residency, I did the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, a phenomenal program. Um, it's a health policy, health services research, which taught me to be able to understand health services research, like Dr. Dimmick talks about, which is where we can give the evidence to, to, to show why it's important to support the policies. Um, during residency, I participated in the American College of Surgeons Advocacy Grant, which um, uh, allowed us to come to DC and meet with legislatures and participate in advocacy training um, as, a, as a resident. Um, as an attending, I participated in the American College of Surgeons Health Policy Scholar Program, which is that picture of all the wonderful surgeons. Uh, some of them you might know are from here from Washington. And this was a phenomenal experience if you haven't participated in it, do it. This is like you spend a week at, at Brandeis University listening to someone who has worked from President Kennedy to President Obama's administration who really knows how do you, how do you make healthcare legislation happen. This is from experience and it's supported by the American College of Surgeons, it's supported by the different surgical specialties. Um, another program that I did that actually um, I was the first surgeon to be a part of, but I'm not the last, and I hope that there will be many, many more surgeons participating in, is the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. It's a leadership training program that's taught by President George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and uh, George H. W. Bush, and um, they bring in people from all across different sectors who are, who are interested in engaging in making our communities better, whether it's a litigation attorney, or a sheriff, or uh, an educator, or a surgeon. And um, I was the first surgeon to be in the program, but I nominated another surgeon. So we have Dr. Chu, who's a, a surgical oncologist and very active in the American College of Surgeons. And I, I strongly, strongly recommend other surgeons participate in this because you get to see how to think outside of medicine. And so much of what impacts medicine is done by people who are not in medicine. Um, so. I think the biggest benefit about these training opportunities is that you get the opportunity to meet people who are like-minded, who are passionate about whatever it is, whether it's um, uh, getting legislation pushed through the Senate or about making your communities better and safer or, or other uh, surgeons who are interested in running healthcare systems. And those friendships are things that last for your lifetime. There are people from all these programs that I still call on when I have a question or I, I just want to pick an idea off of them, and they have been so valuable in my career progression. So, so I think that the main point out of this is that there's always the opportunity to keep growing and to keep learning no matter how old you are, whether you're a medical student or a college student or a resident or a staff attending surgeon. You are never too old to keep learning. 
So I keep going back to the title of the topic because we promised we'd talk about why should I care. And I hope that I convinced you as the three other wonderful speakers before me that what happens here, whether it's in the nation's capital or in Madison or in Baton Rouge or in uh, Salem, Oregon or wherever, impacts what we do in the operating room. And that's why surgeons should care and be here. Um, you don't have to be in those pos positions of power to be at the table. You don't have to be in Washington, D.C. to have a voice. And I think that many of our speakers here have given strong examples of how you can have a voice. Thank you.